The Power Factor Show with Rick, Steve, and Caleb. Episode 72. You can find this podcast and others at Gun Rights Radio Network, gunrightsradio.com, podcasting freedom. Brought to you by Safariland and Hodgton, the gunpowder people. So welcome to Power Factor. I'm Steve. And I'm Rick. So what are we going to talk about today, Rick? We are going to talk about uh, hand-loading component substitution. Right. That's a good good subject. Um, Very timely subject. W- well, hopefully it won't be a timely subject, but mm-hmm. the rate things are going from I've all... I've heard the, ammo prices are yes. already... I, I was going to say, I've heard from... It's interesting that I've heard from three independent sources, and they literally are, are all repeating the same story which is basically it's 2009 all over again um and like you had pointed out i have heard that that ammunition is getting scarce to find and when you do find it the prices are beginning to run up which is exactly what we saw before back in what i refer to as the great ammo shortage 2007 i mean the run-up to the election the last election i mean things got got no better afterwards but people were already kind of anticipating to a certain degree but after the election it got really bad um in fact after you know that happened i was literally down to my last couple thousand primers and was sitting there going I'm shooting a couple thousand rounds or maybe a thousand rounds a month in practice and, you know, matches and whatnot, looking at 1,500 rounds, doing the math. I'm going to run out in three months. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm in trouble. And that actually was one of the things that caused me to start looking at using a 22 conversion as an alternative, saying, I'm going to save the few primers that I have for producing match ammunition. Hopefully that will hold me over for a little while until I can find something. Right. And I'm going to shoot 22 in practice, hoping that someday, um, which it did turn out to be the case, but someday you would be able to find primers again. Well, one of the things about 22, when we had our 22 conversion episode, is we talked about 22 as like a low cost alternative. Right. But at some point, it, you, it could get to the point where it's your only alternative. And that's the way I look at you know. 22 is like, I cannot get primers. And if I want to continue shooting, well, and, and it's not necessarily low cost. I mean, yeah, there was, it got to the point where I went to a, a, a gun. Sh- there's very few gun shops within the Seattle city limits. I went to a gun shop within the Seattle city limits, and I paid ten dollars for a hundred round box of twenty two long rifle. Mm-hmm. And it's not exotic. It's not you know ultra velocity hollow points or whatever. This was just standard velocity, uh, solid forty grain twenty two long rifle. Uh, it was 10 cents a round, and right. that's about what it costs, not much less than it costs me to hand load, uh, you know, 9 millimeter or something. Right. So it's not just that the 22 is cheap, but maybe it's not cheap, but if you can get it, at least you can keep shooting. Right, and that's what a lot of this gets down to is if you can get it, and sometimes you can't get it, and that's where the problems run in. Um, and that's kind of where the, the focus of this whole entire episode is going, is that we're kind of taking the assumption of... You know, we talked before about your different alternatives in terms of bullets. So if you have been shooting jacketed, you know, you might be able to step down to plated or you might be able to step down to molly or something like that in term, in, until you can hold over, until you can get your jacketed ammunition again. Um, cases are over the place. For the most part, if you shoot, you pick them up, they're free. Um, Unless and, you're shooting something like 357 SIG and then you're all Yeah, <laughs> you know, you'll be picking up your own brass. But that's the other good point, I should say, is that if you spend the time to pick your stuff up, you're really at a no-loss situation. You shoot around, you pick up your round. So it's not really like you're not, yeah. you're not losing anything in terms of you know, metallic, is that you lose the bullet, you lose the primer, you lose the powder, you keep your case. Yeah. So, um, and and I, pick up. Pick it up and trade. If it's a caliber you don't yeah, shoot, right. you can trade for one that you right. do. Yeah, you know? and you, I mean, whether it's on eBay, if they even allow, well, probably not on eBay. Maybe they do on eBay. I don't know. I don't think they have cases anymore on eBay. Yeah, it used to be, but not anymore. Um, but I usually find somebody who is, you know, looking for what you got, and you got something, that, or you need something that they have, and you can make a trade on that. So, I, I would say, in terms of substitution, there are certain powder substitutions you can do or what you could do is look for a different powder or something and load up something you know slightly different so maybe you're running clays and you're out of clays but you got tight group you can possibly find a tight group load or something like that that works out for you so there's that kind of substitution you can make but ultimately it gets down to and i saw this primarily during the last shortage as it all came down to primers it was like you, you could find powder you have to the wait for of, it. it. Might be expensive. Yeah, the price of bullets went up pretty high. Um, 
but it, it was literally down to, you know, yes, I can pay money and get this other stuff, but for primers, it was like, it didn't matter how much money you had, everybody was out of stock. Yeah. Um, and that's when it got kind of spooky and that you were kind of going, I'm looking at this going, I literally may be out of shooting here very soon at the rate that I'm going. Um, and one of the alternatives that I took is I, I typically had, had shot Winchester primers and I was down to my last stash of that. You couldn't find Winchester, you couldn't find CCI, you couldn't find Federal. In fact, you couldn't find anything, but then all of a sudden some of these other manufacturers from communist countries known as Wolf. Former, formerly communist countries. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's still communism in, in Russia. Well, there's communism here, too, but you're well, well, okay. not only in Olympia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. anyway. <laughs> I digress. Yeah. So at any rate, I started using Wolf primers. Now, the, the thing there is that I had done some research and I on Brininos, and I had heard that the Wolf pistol primers had a, they changed the cut material and they had a reputation of not going off, going bang. Um, whereas, when you wanted them to. When you wanted them to. Whereas the rifle primers were a little bit softer and had a better chance of going bang when you wanted them to. So when I saw primers from Wolf coming in the market, my choice was either to go with the rifle primers or go with the pistol primers. And from all accounts that I had heard, the pistol ones had problems, so I went with the rifle primers. Now, the thing with rifle primers is that the cut material is usually harder because of a rifle primer than a standard pistol primer, and it can be more difficult to set off. And I discovered that with my Glock, um, in that I was probably experiencing about a 2 or 3% failure rate. And with my STI, it was much higher, but then I later discovered it was not probably the primers, it was the hammer strut issue, which I talked about in great detail in a previous episode. Um, but these are some of the, the, you know, the variations that you, you may have to make or may have to consider um, in situations like this. Now I can tell you the one downside of potentially using a rifle primer is that you can get, I, I, and I, I have not seen this, but I've heard it mentioned, is that effectively gas blow by. Since rifle primers are usually designed to operate in a higher pressure environment, the idea is that the cup is going to um, expand and close up the area, the ring, effectively around the primer hole. And since the pressures that we're shooting are fairly low pressure, you're shoving a rifle primer. And from what I've heard, the dimensions are the same. But for I don't, small primers. For small, right, for large or not. Okay. For small, small rifle, small pistol, they're supposed to be the same. We're very close. But the problem from what I've heard is that you'll get gas blow by or can get gas blow by from around the outer edge of the primer and that'll eventually erode your breech face. Now, people who shoot 38 Super in open all use rifle primer. Well, for understand the, the rule of thumb there is use a rifle primer because of the fact that the cut material is harder um, and there it's not so much of an issue. But if you're using this in 9mm or in 40 or whatnot, this can be more of an issue. Yeah, and my experience was um, the same in that I, I usually used Winchesters, and I don't know why I really had a preference. They, they worked, and I guess they were available, but then, of right. course, when they weren't available, then I was casting about for an alternative, and I also ended up with the Russian primers, and unlike Steve, I've, I've had absolutely no issues with them at all. Um, I've, I've gone through... Uh, six or eight thousand of the Wolf brand large pistol primers with no issues and I've uh, since bought 5,000 Tula primers mm -hmm. which I've heard are made in the same plant mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mean they're the same but uh, I haven't got into those yet but um, I've also heard very I mean I've heard people complain even uh, that a certain brand of American-made primer doesn't feed as smoothly through a certain type of primer feed is another one right. that there's a s slight variation in the diameter of the cup or something and it doesn't trickle through as, as uh, readily as other mm -hmm. brands do or there'll be more variation. Um, but again, we're talking about a situation where maybe you're only going to be able to get one brand right. or one type, you know, let's say, uh, you, the only thing you can find, let's say, is whatever brand they happen to have of small rifle primers. And even if you're shooting nine millimeter pistol exclusively, uh, you might just have to adapt to that. Now, you also have to be aware that if you start substituting any component for another component, 
any printed load data you have mm -hmm. uh, or any load data you've accumulated for yourself goes out the window right. because your uh, the the intensity with which the primer uh, burns can affect the burn rate of the powder, which can affect your pressure. And if you've, let's say, developed a bunch of load data with uh, cast lead bullets and Winchester primers and uh, 231 powder, and now you're going to start assembling loads with plated bullets and uh, small rifle primers and, you know, AA number seven, uh, it, it, there's nothing that you can it, it translate there's from one load the to the other. Yeah, right. Everything's and there's no load data different. for that, anything like that. Yeah, yeah. and so you, you can't rely on any, anything that you've accumulated in if you start changing components. I mean, even sometimes you'll see, uh, for instance, uh, load data published by a bullet manufacturer mm -hmm. will include the use of their bullets. And so you want to uh, use a different bullet that's of, even of the same weight mm -hmm you don't necessarily know that the data is going to translate perfectly from one to the other. And it can be the same way with, uh, with the primers. But it, but, but it should, for the most it part, should be in, in terms of bullets. Yeah, I mean, it should be discussing close. Like, I mean, somebody's 180 grain full metal jacket bullet should be very similar in terms of load ballistics as somebody else's it should be. 180 grain jacket at hollow point. Right. But yeah. I, but I've heard people who load. It's not a given, instance, but it should be close. I've heard people who uh, load uh, Montana Gold bullets say the jacket material appears to be considerably harder, harder to push through the bore, and yeah. you have to increase your charge weight. Uh, you have to increase your charge weight to get the same velocities right. as you would with another brand of jacket bullets. Mm -hmm. So there can be some mm -hmm. differences. Right. Um, same thing with primers. I uh, b had to buy because uh, it was all I could get. Uh, I bought 5,000 Magnum pistol primers, and you'll find like Winchester that right on the box it says uh, suitable for uh, standard and Magnum use. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they also do think make a they dedicated make a Magnum, Magnum primer. primer. Yeah. But they claim that this one primer that comes in this blue box is right. suitable for both. Right. Well, when I loaded uh, my normal bullet and my normal case and my normal uh, powder charge, but substituted the Magnum primer. Uh, velocities and presumably pressures went up mm -hmm. and uh, you know it got to the point where I thought hey you know I could probably reduce my charge weight a couple of tenths and if the primers cost the same for magnum and non magnum I might as well use magnum primers all right. the time right but of course there's no load data for the combination of powder and bullet and case and magnum primers because the powder I'm using uh, does not require the use of magnum primers so there's no printed load data that uses magnum primers. You're kind of becoming an experimental hand loader yep. at that point. And uh, anytime you're experimenting, boy, you better uh, you better be extremely cautious. And, and start at the bottom, and work. you literally need to go into load development mode all over again. So rather than you know starting where your normal base load was before, if you make a, a, a primer ship like that, and it's funny you should mention this because I did the exact same thing when primers started first becoming available again the magnum primer showed up first and i'm looking at going okay well my you know i've already had not so great experience with the wolf stuff i'm running even more out of my um my winchester small pistol primers here and then all of a sudden you know i get an email notification from graphs or whatever of you know magnum primer is now in stock from winchester it's like mm -hmm. going Huh? <laughs> you know, do I do I try this or not? Right. So I did. I went out and bought um, some, like you were saying, the dedicated or the actual, you know, Mart Magnum Winchester primers, small pistol, and uh, got some of those and basically, you know, loaded them and chronoed immediately and looked for any signs of high pressure and noticed in my case. And again, this is not going to be true across the board everywhere. But in my case, the velocity went up about 10 or 15 feet per second. And I'm going, okay, well, that being the case, I'm going to drop my charge by about a tenth and see what it does next. And I dropped it by a tenth, and I found that a tenth happened to be the right number mm -hmm. for using the Magnum primers. But it, I think it really depends, and I, this is the infamous your mileage may vary thing, is that it depends obviously on what caliber you're shooting, what what um, powder you're shooting this with because some powders may light off more with a magnum primer versus a non-magnum 
um, depending on how much case volume you have. Some of them may be infected more with more or less case volume than a different, you know, powder. Well, and also is your load near maximum, near to, maximum begin to begin with? with yeah, adding yeah. a magnum primer may, might push it right, into a dangerous right. area in terms of pressure. Right. So you have to really, when you're experimenting with components, you have to remember that it's an experiment and that your eyeballs and your fingers and whatnot is what you're risking when you do it. Yeah, and a lot of load development or load data books will have a beginning load and a max load and, and you know, your IPSC slash IDPA load is somewhere in between those two points, hopefully. Um, but I would really, if you if you do do a primer shift like this, um, start and go back down to minimum, put the magnum primer in, and then start working your load back up to where you, um, you know, where it starts falling in the range that you want it to. So we got some reader uh, email questions. Abington, Abington, that's the home of MG, if you all recall. Great uh, British motor Did car you have in an the MG? 60s and 70s. No, my brother yeah. uh, has an MGA, uh, but really? Abing Abington on Thames is the home of MG for many years. Hmm. I don't know if Abington, their, our questioner, has anything to do with that, but safety fast, Abington. Anyway, question was about IDPA and the 180 rule. Um, uh, if you've shoot at, shot any uh, USPSA or IPSC, you know that uh, essentially your muzzle can never point up range is what it amounts to. You've got a line that passes through you that's per or parallel to the back burn, perpendicular to the direction of downrange, and that's the, the universal safe muzzle direction in USPSA. Uh, when IDPA was uh, formed some years later, they very specifically said we do not have a 180 rule and we will have muzzle safe points that are established for each stage. And which, what, is, which is one of the things that allowed them to say you can't point your muzzle over the berm too because they can say, pop yes, that berm we, up there, muzzle we discover, safe point. We discussed that in the local right. rules episode right. that you have a 180 rule that, that goes this way and this way. Um, but if you have a muzzle safe point rule, you could essentially put a, a muzzle safe point at the top of the berm and prevent somebody from raising their gun above that point. And what it does is it just it just gives the stage designer and the match director flexibility to you you could narrow the the safe muzzle direction mm -hmm. to less than 180 or expand it beyond 180. Mm -hmm. uh, we happen to have a bay at our range where we can shoot through about 270 degrees. And you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, you know, if I'm facing this way is the 180 this way, and if I'm facing this way is the 180 this way. You just say, here's a cone, don't point your muzzle beyond that, and there's a cone, and don't point your muzzle beyond that, and that's safe. And, uh, but I have discovered, uh, and it's the, true at our club as well, that a lot of clubs establish, IDPA clubs that is, establish the 180 as the default muzzle safe point so that unless you have a specific course of fire or a specific bay perhaps that has different requirements that are specified, um, the 180 will be kind of the default muzzle right. safe point. Right. And so although there's nothing, the rule book very specifically says we don't have a 180 rule, you'll find that most clubs, in my experience, we'll have established a default 180. A default 180 yeah. And then if it varies from the 180, uh, there will be some indication. Let you know about it. Yeah. yeah. So having in there you go, there's no 180 rule, but you'll generally find a 180 rule in effect at most clubs. Uh, Eric uh, inquired about a Safari Land paddle holster. Um, there is only, I believe, one reference in the rule book to paddle holsters. They uh, define different types of holsters, the inside the waistband, the pouch style, the Avenger style. Um, and in the pouch style description, uh, it, there's a mention of uh, paddle holsters being legal. And uh, we've gotten a number of inquiries about paddle holsters. Seems like a lot recently about paddle holsters. Yeah, and I don't know if it's for convenience. Uh, people that uh, you know want to be able to put their gun on and take their gun off maybe while it's in the holster without having to deal with taking off the belt. Uh, I personally think paddle holsters are a bad idea. Um, I don't think they're very secure. I have literally seen somebody go to draw their gun and pull the holster out with it. Um, that would be funny. Yeah, and it's just a matter of, you know, it's supposed to be easy on, easy off. That's the whole idea behind the paddle holster. And so the fact that it comes out of the belt somewhat easy, easily. Easy out. Yeah, it comes out <laughs> easily. And so, you know, I'm just kind of against it. Um, Eric specifically was kind of interesting, uh, inquired about a model of paddle holster made by Safari Land. And the holster that he referenced was the paddle version of the belt holster that I reviewed in the Safari Land Equipment uh, episode. So if you saw that episode and saw that holster, 
Um, I, would, I would recommend, if you like that type of holster, that adjustability, I would recommend getting the one that threads through the belt um, rather than the paddle holster. Uh, just in general, I think it, the paddle holster is kind of an unsatisfactory design. If you absolutely have to have the ability to take the thing on and off quickly for a carry gun, you know, maybe you are constantly going into post offices or something, or uh, you have to take your gun off on a regular basis, um, it might have some value. But I think for competition where you put the thing on before the match and then there's no need to take it off until the match is over, uh, skip the paddle. I just don't think it's a very secure way to holster the gun. You know, that's an interesting thing is that the point that we have received a lot of questions, it seems like recently, about paddle holsters and the questions have primarily been aimed at IDPA. Is there something in the IDPA rule book that would lead one to believe that either A, paddle holsters outright in themselves are illegal or some attribute or feature about a paddle holster based on space, <laughs> gap, or whatever is illegal? I think it's because the rule book spends so much time on defining the location of the holster relative to the belt. There's a lot of discussion of no airspace oh. between the belt and the holster and the distance um, you know, from any backing pieces of the holster to the belt. And of course, on a paddle design, the holster is gonna probably be right up against the belt because the paddle is on the inside, right. back side of the belt, right. and pulling it right up against it. And, yeah. there's, and, and I think the, 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 the rule book gives short shrift to paddle holsters. There's just the word, the phrase paddle holster, I think appears just once in the 10 pages that cover the different, pa uh, they, mm. like they don't say, there's five types of holsters, inside the waistband, da 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 da, and paddle holsters. You know, they, they, uh, the paddle holster is a subgroup of right, the pouch right, right, design. Right, right. And so I think you could flip through the pages and, and miss the part where it says, and paddle holsters, okay. you know. Okay. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons is that they just don't spend a lot of time on it and they don't consider it a separate kind of subcategory like they do in inside the waistband versus an outside the waistband. And so paddle holsters are legal as long as they fulfill all of the other requirements. It's just a different way of attaching it to your body and it's legal, but again, I just, I don't like it. Okay, yeah, I just thought maybe there was something possibly in the rule book that implied that no, I just, think, I just think it's the fact that they don't spend a lot of time on it. It's okay. like by, they, they sort of... Uh, Question by omission. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I can't find any reference to it. it. seems to be kind of the popular theme. Okay. You know, so what are the rules? And the, and the paddle style holster is legal as long as it fulfills all the other requirements. Right, okay. Okay, so... If any other questions, you know where to get us. We're going to be right here. Here. <laughs> yeah. So back to the topic of uh, component substitution. When things start getting, you know, I mean, when the zombies start attacking and you're locked in your basement. Oh God, I hate that whole entire zombie and, thing. And you're running out of know, primers. Who what are you going to do? That was a good idea. Yeah. Um, so be ready to be uh, flexible. You know, you might have to change your primers. You might have to change your powder, your bullets. Um, be keep low data around for the different components. Uh, powder manufacturers, bullet manufacturers. Uh, generally have somewhat different data. I mean, I think right. you know a lot of times the, the data that's published by bullet makers utilize their bullets. Their bullets, yeah. Um, powder manufacturers, I think they're a little more like, you know, this is data for a 180 grain right. FMJ, yeah. you know. Right. So keep that uh, alternate data available so that if, you know, you get a crunch in components, uh, you have stuff to reference. Um, and also, you know, maybe kind of case the local store, see what kind of supplies they have. Mm. Um, if you if you can get something now, you know, I'm I'm a I'm really against the hoarding. I was just going to say I'm not going to go out and suggest that you start hoarding components. I mean, apparently there I've read stories about people who like took a second mortgage on their house and bought fifty thousand dollars worth of uh, primers or powder wow. or whatever. And you know, uh, I, I, there's. I think all that does is kind of screw it up for everybody else who just needs a thousand primers. Well, you know, you know, it's funny not to deviate things too much, but during the last shortage, which was when the economy was tanking, and you had made the comment of when things come back online, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing people selling off all the primers that they bought because of the fact that the economy... Well, somebody spent $50,000 on primers and then lost their job. Yeah. You can't eat primers. No, and not so very well. I, so I think anybody who's got... $100,000 worth of primers or bullets or ammo in their basement or their bomb <laughs> shelter or wherever they have it, um, you know, it's going to, that stuff is going to, it's going to come back on the market someday. Right, you know, right. I don't think they're, these people who bought the stuff are shooters. That's one of the interesting things too, is I would kind of poll people for a six month period. I'd be at a match. 
you know, how many hundreds of thousands of primers have, have you bought, you know? And the guys that I know that shoot every weekend were not hoarding. You know, the yeah. guys who actually shoot didn't seem to be buying stuff in huge quantities. So I'm well, like going... Well, you couldn't buy it. You couldn't right, find it. You couldn't. Yeah, but, but yeah. There, there was a period of time there where I could go into a gun store and there would be, you know, a box of 45 ammo there on the shelf priced at $40 if I wanted to buy a box, mm -hmm. you know. But this idea that, uh, um, you know, that, that, that it just seemed to me that the hoarding was being done by people who maybe someday expected that they were going to shoot it, yeah. but it wasn't being hoarded by people who were active shooters. Shooting it, yeah. I, I think sometimes we're also our own worst enemies with respect to that is because people go off and they start, you know, hoarding ammunition or hoarding primers or whatever, and that just, you know, it's just, it's... <laughs> It's a catch-22. It just well, drives yeah, everything up for everybody. Prophecy. Right, right. If everybody it's, buys 100,000 rounds, then there's not going to be, be any ammo yeah, left other yeah. than what's in your basement. Wasn't there like a TP shortage years ago back in, I don't know what decade or whatever, that somebody had hinted that they were going to run out of toilet paper or something like that? So people started, oh my God, I'm not going to run out of toilet paper. Me. It's like, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, so people, mm. there was a toilet paper shortage or something to that effect. So. <laughs> I'm That'd not, I'm not suggesting that you go out and buy a lot of toilet paper right now. It might um, be better than buying lots of primers. Yeah, but... Um, you could if, maybe swap toilet paper for primers if things <laughs> find really somebody. got dicey. You know? Yeah. But, um, I mean, personally speaking, I have gone out and bought a good supply of, of um, shotgun primers just so I have a quantity of that. Um, and right now everything's accessible, and hopefully things won't get as bad as what they were before. You know, you might, if you're in the ability right now to go out and buy a sleeve of primers or whatever, you might go ahead and do it. Um, if things get bad, um, take our advice here and be prepared for you know making some substitution, substitutions if you have to. And hopefully now you'll be a little more educated about what you can do um, with respect to substituting primers and, and bullets and powder. So, till next time then. Oh, if you have any questions or comments on this topic or topics, you can always send us an email at powerfactorshow at gmail .com. or the powerfactorshow.com, the website, or or Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Facebook. That would be a good place to do it. And what would that be? I have no I idea. I have no idea what that yeah. would be. <laughs> Facebook.com slash Power Factor Show. Exactly. Right. See ya. See ya.